століттями називали нас малоросами, топтали наш прапор, насміхалися з нашої мови і творили кумедний образ українця з оселецем в салені галушками. Під п'яне гикання і звуки російської гармонії вони нас вбивали, морили голодом, розпинали по червоних катівнях і відправляли у вічну мерзлоту сибірських таборів. Вбивали доти, доки у миролюбній хліборобській нації не прокинулося щось страшне. Щось, що віками дрімало у надрах дніпровських круч. Первісний і прадавній український бог. І тепер ми збираємо свої криваві жнива. Тепер на вас усіх чекає смерть. Забучу, Ірпінь, Київ, Харків, Одесу, Маріуполь. Ви будете вбиті всі. Ваші трупи, як найгірше падло, лежатимуть в полях, лісосмугах і вздовж доріг. Їх роздиратимуть собаки і дикі тварини, а ваші матері чекатимуть вас в твірі, пскові, рязані. Але ви, сучі виродки, не повернетесь додому. Ніколи. Добро пожаловать в ад. Тепера! Сухевич! Героїв України! Ну що, москалику? Поговоримо? Слава Україні! Героям слава! Слава нації! Смерть! Москалям! So just recently, uh, there was a video that came out of Ukraine showing a Ukrainian actress by the name of Adriana Kurilets uh, doing a mock murder of a Russian soldier. And she has these flowers on her head and she has this uh, traditional Ukrainian gown on and she has a sickle in her hand. And she slices the neck of this Russian soldier. And then she declares something like, now is the time for, now is the time to harvest our bloody harvest or something like that. It kind of reminds me of the stuff that has come out of the West Bank. Uh, I remember decades ago seeing a video from the West Bank in which, in which Palestinian children would exclaim things like we knock on the doors of heaven with the with the skulls of jews and that kind of reminds me of this video coming out of ukraine uh <laughs> yeah although i haven't seen palestinians producing videos where they show a woman slicing the neck of an idf soldier um america went through 9-11 and America didn't produce videos like this. Um, I've never seen an American produced video in which a woman is depicted with, let's say, the Statue of Liberty crown on her head and she has a sword or an ax in her hand and she beheads a Mujahideen fighter. I haven't seen anything like that coming out of America. But in Ukraine, you have stuff like this. And this video sheds a light on the dark side of Ukraine. The reason why stuff like this bothers me is because I don't see current things just by themselves. I don't think we should take something that comes out of the present and just confine it to the present moment. We have to look at things and put them against the history of the culture in which they transpire, in which they manifest. So propaganda like this, here we see a Ukrainian woman, sickle in her hand. She has the traditional uh, flower crown on her head. She has the traditional Slavic uh, gown on, and she has this you know, traditional attire on. 
and she's there's a wheat field behind her. There's all of the there's all of this imagery that denotes the message of tradition and and being proud of your of, of the nation, being proud of the Ukrainian nation. Anytime you see anything to do with being a proud Ukrainian or being a proud Slav for that matter, uh, you're almost always going to see that outfit. You're almost always, not almost always, but you're many times you're going to see a woman wearing that outfit or you're going to see uh, a, a Slavic man dressed up with a traditional uh, with uh, a, a traditional gown on or, or, or traditional clothing. Um, and, and so when you see this video, it's obvious, it's obvious what the message is. Like we are proud Ukrainians. We're proud of the nation. We're going to kill the Russian occupiers and the invaders. But also you have to remember the fact that in Ukraine, they have the cult of Slav Ukraina. And we have reached such levels of cringe when we see Americans and Westerners saying Slav Ukraina because they say, I, and I understand, like a lot of these people, they have good intentions because they see the Russians as the evil invaders and they see the Ukrainians as the underdog. And so they just see the Ukrainians fighting the Russians as people defending themselves. And that's understandable. I completely understand that. But we should not isolate current situations with the present moment. We shouldn't isolate them to the present moment. We shouldn't keep them limited to the present. We have to see them through the lens of history. And when you look at you, and here's the thing is people, oh my goodness, this is so, it's kind of funny. People say things like, why are you so obsessed with Ukrainian history? Why are you so stuck in history? And my response to that is, why are the Ukrainians so stuck in history? Why are the Ukrainians so, uh, so proud of their dark history to the point where they would literally ban a movie about a huge massacre in which tens of thousands of Polish people were murdered uh, in their country. Why would they ban such a film? That happened years ago. I think it was back in, uh, what was it, 2016? There was a film, it was called, uh, I think it was I think the the, the, the the original title of the film was Volyn because the massacre much of the massacre took place in a, in a region of Poland called Volynia, although there was a lot of killing that went on in other regions. Uh, for the English speaking audience, it was called Hatred. but it was a very it was a I would say it was a very well done film. Um, it was a little soapy, but nonetheless there are many moments of the film where the director's creativity really shines. And the film shows, what the Ukrainian nationalist who followed Stepan Bandera did to the Poles. It was a Polish film, and the Poles were very open about having this film shown in Ukraine because the Poles were very enthusiastic about bettering relations with Ukraine and reconciling, uh, having some sort of reconciliation done between Ukraine and Poland due to the bloody history. And the Ukrainian government banned that movie. Um, so, and, and, and the Ukrainian parliament, and I've said this many times, the Ukrainian parliament dec has declared members of the OUN who organize and who, who, who uh, orchestrated this bloodshed, members of the OUN as heroes. It's come to the point where President Zelensky himself has to pay lip service to the leaders of the OUN, and for those of you who don't know, the OUN, OUN stands for Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. It was a giant paramilitary, paramilitary organization founded by Stepan Bandera and his partners, uh, uh, and, and also by um, Andrei Melanik, who literally pledged allegiance to, to Hitler. And Zelensky has to pay lip service to these people as they are heroes. He has to declare them as heroes. And he's a Jew. And this is the thing. Everyone's like, well, Zelensky's a Jew. How could Ukraine be having a Nazi problem? Well, sure, their president is Jewish. Yes, they voted for a Jewish person. Person. That's a fair point. But when it comes to the point where a Jewish president has to pay lip service to those who murdered his people, 
that tells me that the the ultra nationalists in Ukraine are influential enough and they are present enough that they have that sort of leverage and influence, especially over the culture and the society. Um, and they are streets in Ukraine named after Stepan Bandera. So when I see videos like this and they have you know the woman and she, she's with she's dressed in this traditional attire and she has the flowers on her hair and she has a sickle in her hand and it's all it's all it's all traditionalism right when you see this it's all conservatism and traditionalism and uh and being proud of your nation and then we see that and then she's slicing up a and there's nothing again there's nothing wrong with the clothing that she has I'm not condemning it but when she's slicing the neck of a Russian soldier, that tells me something. And she's talking about harvesting a bloody harvest. And this type of propaganda is being done in a context wherein Russian Orthodox churches are being attacked. Um, Ukrainian Orthodox churches are being attacked simply because they are under the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, this is being this propaganda is being uh, uh, conveyed this message is being conveyed in uh, an atmosphere where for years ethnic Russians have been attacked by nationalists where um, uh, where uh, uh, people within the Ukrainian government have referred to the Russian Orthodox Church as part of the enemy so it's not just people versus soldiers this could be Definitely escalate, and it has escalated to people versus other people. And it has, this has been taking place, but it's, it's, it, it hasn't, it, it hasn't been going on in the scale of what took place in 1943 in Volinia and Poland. That has not happened yet. But with such tension and with such sanguinary and, and bloody propaganda, I can totally see. Um, mob violence being done against ethnic Russians um, in Ukraine. I can totally see it be. I could. I can totally see it being done. Now, people are talking about Ukraine, and 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 everybody sympathizes with Ukraine. Most people do, at least in the West. Here's the thing: in 2020. There was a war between the Azeris and the Armenians. I did numerous videos on this. I interviewed um, an Armenian doctor, an Armenian doctor who was living in Stepanakert, which was uh, the, the biggest city in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh where the fighting was taking place. Um, I, did a, I did numerous articles on the subject. I've written about Armenia and the Armenian genocide for years. And that is a subject, that, that whole situation is something that is dear to my heart. Uh, I've also talked a lot about Ukraine. I've talked about Ukraine for years. I want to re-upload my old videos that I did years ago on Ukraine, warning people about Ukrainian nationalism. I've been talking about it for years. I've been talking about it going all the way back to, I want to say, 2015. And it's amazing that when, and this is why I'm bringing up Armenia, it's amazing that before Russia invaded Ukraine, um, there was a lot of focus on the Azov Battalion, and the mainstream media was referring to it as a big, major, right-wing paramilitary organization that's very well organized, and it's well-funded, and it's well-networked, and now they're trying to minimize it. Why are they trying to minimize it? Because... It looks very silly for, it looks hypocritical for people in the mainstream media to support Ukraine when you have this giant elephant in the room called bonderism. How do you deal with that? How do you reconcile your liberalism with the fact that there is this very violent ultranationalism that is quite prevalent in Ukraine? How do you deal with that? The way you deal with it, if you're a hypocrite, is you belittle the reality. You belittle the fact that the elephant is in the room. Oh, it's not really an elephant. It's actually just a, 
a giant rat that has a giant straw coming out of its mouth. It's not really an elephant, so let's not even talk about it. And the reason why they're doing this is because Ukraine is one of our guys. Ukraine is one of the guys of NATO, right? It's not a member of NATO, but it definitely is an ally. Same thing goes with Japan. Japan is a country where nationalism is very prevalent. The Liberal Democratic Party has been in power for a very long time. Um, it was founded by ultranationalists. It was backed by the CIA. Shinzo Abe's Liberal Democratic Party is one of our guys. That's like the Taliban of Japan, like the Mujahideen of Japan, right? And the reason why America backed those guys, backed the, the ultra-nationalists, was because America was worried about left-wing parties who would be more cozy to China or more open to bettering relations with China. America was, wor was worried about those guys taking power. In Japanese politics. So what did America do? America backed the ultra-nationalists. America backed the people who deny Nanking, who, who um, minimize uh, Japan's atrocities or blatantly deny that they even happened. And why does America do that? Because Japan is one of our guys. And we want to use Japan as a check against the Russians and the Chinese. And this has been within America's collective mentality or political mentality for for generations uh, you can go all the way back to the early 1900s when japan defeated russia in the first uh, russo-japanese war and america watched as the japanese slaughtered uh, tens of thousands of russian troops and america looked at japan and said we can use those guys against the chinese and against the russians so after the Second World War, I mean, when, it, when, when all of Japan's cruelty comes to light, um, after Pearl Harbor, you have, uh, you have the reality of Japanese atrocities, comfort women, the extermination of peoples in areas, in countries that Japan occupied. You have all of this dark reality coming to light. What do you do with all that? How do you deal with it? Well, you say Japan isn't really like that anymore. And then at the same time, you back those who support the very ideology that led Japan into that dark path. Because Japan is one of our guys. And that goes back to Turkey and Armenia. Yeah, it's true. The Ottoman Empire butchered a million Armenians. And it's true that in Turkey today, they still deny that they even happened. And the very country that denies the Armenian genocide, backs Azerbaijan's war against Armenia. And so here you have the Azeris, you have the Turks, they both deny the Armenian genocide, and Turkey is a country that's controlled by Islamists and nationalists, people who adhere to the ideology of the Grey Wolves. How do you deal with all that? How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile yourself as a country that that boasts about defeating the Third Reich and work with Turkey at the same time? How do you how do you do that? How do you reconcile the two? Uh, you just ignore it. And when Azerbaijan was at war with the Armenians over Nagorno-Karabakh. There were videos of Azeri soldiers beheading civilians, and nobody gave a damn. Nobody gave a damn. We're talking about Russian soldiers and what they're doing in Ukraine, and there's all sorts of claims being made about how bad Russian soldiers are. But when Ukrainians do something bad, we don't talk about it. Which really goes to show that it's not really about exposing crimes and atrocities. It's really just about using propaganda to attack the side that the empire is against. And if, Azerbaij if Azerbaijani soldiers behead civilians and murder civilians, we're not even going to talk about that because that doesn't really help us. It's not advantageous to us. But if Armenia did something bad, then we would talk about it. If Russia does something bad, if China does something bad, then we're going to talk about it because it suits 
us. That's the bottom line. Anyway, you guys just heard some Theo Logi. God bless.